Today marks the 20th anniversary of the PlayStation 1's launch in the United States of America. In celebration of this, I have picked 20 of my favorite games from the PlayStation lineup. 20 years for 20 games, let's just get right into it. We're gonna go alphabetically. First of all, we got Brave Fencer Musashi. Now, this is a game that I thought was something else. I saw on the box Final Fantasy VIII, so I thought this might be Final Fantasy VIII just kind of rebranded, and I didn't really know anything about Final Fantasy at the time. I played three on the Super Nintendo, and I played seven, and I thought like, oh, they changed it, they changed the name. And I didn't really read close enough. But anyway, I bought this game thinking it had something to do with Final Fantasy. But, you know, it was square soft, so not like it was too far off. And the 8 in question was actually a demo for the game. So, <laughs> anyway, this is like an action game. And it's very close to one of my favorite Super Nintendo games of all time, which is The Legend of the Mystical Ninja. Now, you are this young samurai, Musashi, summoned to this kingdom that's in peril by this princess. It has an awesome combat system. You can steal moves from enemies and use it. Kind of like Mega Man, only if Mega Man could just copy any random enemy he wanted to. Cool action combat, kind of a quirky little story, a little talkative, but uh, a neat little adventure for the PlayStation 1 that probably not a lot of people played. So hopefully it'll get released on the PSN sometime soon. Next up we have Breath of Fire 4. Now this is a game I didn't play till very recently. And I like it. I am a fan of the Breath of Fire series. I think they're kind of an underrated um, RPG, and they're really kind of Capcom's only thing. And for them to kind of ignore that is kind of a big... I don't know. I mean, they, back in the day, they kind of did it to compete with Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest and stuff, and then they kind of tapered off just because of sales or who knows what. But anyway... By my standards, this game still looks great. Uh, Capcom, in the late PlayStation era, had this amazing uh, low polygonal look to everything that kind of looks like cell shading now today. Um, this is the same with Mega Man Legends 2. It just looks fantastic. Uh, cool combat system, awesome visuals. You're just going along as the same old character, uh, Ryu, and you got Nina in there. You can turn into dragons. You have Fight monsters. It's a turn-based RPG. I mean, what else can I say? Uh, Breath of Fire is just a cool series, and this is kind of kind of the highlight for me for the system. I I, I think three and four are pretty up there, though. I, I have a soft place in my heart for all of them, but that's a story for another day. Even though I just did a retrospective on Breath of Fire earlier in the year, but uh, <laughs> let's go back to that to hear me ramble on some more on that. Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Now, I dabbled with the NES game uh, in the heyday of it, and I remember it being really, really hard. And I borrowed this game from a friend who also just kind of got a PlayStation around the same time, and I just immediately fell in love with it. Just the open-ended Metroid style. I mean, this is this is the Castlevania that made the Metroidvania thing. Uh, first, it was Super Metroid that really kind of did it. Uh, to a lesser extent, I guess, the original Metroid. I suppose, but you know, Super Metroid is more of perfection, and Castlevania added all the RPG elements and stuff um, in Symphony of the Night. Uh, you can collect weapons, it just was a more open-ended and a connected world, and has like a, a Shadow World too. Just this huge daunting thing that kind of, you know, puts Super Metroid out of the place. I think Super Metroid and then Symphony of the Night are kind of like the two peaks for, you know, this type of genre that a lot of people don't like to call it, but I like it. I love Metroidvania. And this is the peak, and it's just so good. It's readily available anywhere you go. I totally recommend you play that. The voice acting is maybe w weird, and uh, but the gameplay holds up very cool. I mean, you're the son of Dracula, and you're playing this game and just fighting crap, and ah, uh, it's so good. This is another game that I actually just covered, and that's Chrono Crash. Now. This may not hold up to Chrono Trigger, but I still loved playing it. I remember walking to a GameStop, uh, not knowing anything about games at all because, you know, game magazines were readily available, but didn't have any subscriptions or anything like that. This is before online was really huge, or, I mean, I didn't really have a computer for a long time either. Anyway, I walk into GameStop, and I see the back of this box, and I kind of turn over because it looked kind of a cool PlayStation game, and it says Chrono Cross, and I'm just like, what? And then upon closer inspection on that box, it said something like 10 years in the making or 5 years. And it was a sequel and a long time in the making. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I was so excited. I bought it. It had 
almost nothing to do with Chrono Trigger, and I was a little upset by that, but the game was so much fun. A really weird combat system that kind of takes you a while, along with the story. The story is, I wouldn't say convoluted, but it just seems more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, but you know, that's what you get into, alternate dimensions. But uh, some of the best music of, you know, this era, I don't think the visuals hold up that well compared to some other games but you know again I talked about this very recently and I still think it's a good game that is worthy of your time. Of course my PlayStation childhood became one with Crash Bandicoot 2. I remember my brother having Crash Bandicoot 2, Final Fantasy 7, and Siphon Filter 2. I don't know how we got them from friends or whatever. Either way, I played the crap out of Crash Bandicoot 2. My whole family did. My dad loved it. My sister loved it. Uh, my brother played it. It was just kind of one of those family events. It was kind of like, it, it really was like the evolution of Mario because we had played that uh, on the Super Nintendo so many times and we graduated from there to a PlayStation, so we skipped the N64, we missed the 3D Mario, but we just loved Crash Bandicoot. It was funny, it was cute, the music was awesome, still gets stuck in my head all the time. I think two and three are really just two fantastic games, but I gotta go with my first crush with Crash Bandicoot 2. I can still play it hours and hours and hours. It's just fun, just simple fun. And it really is one of those games where I just wish that Naughty Dog will get the rights back to make another one. I don't want some gritty thing. Or I just want Sony to get the rights back so they can make some kind of cool sequel because when the rights went to somebody else, I think it was Activision, they were not great. They tried to change him, he has a weird mohawk and just gave him an attitude. It just seems like the Sonic era of just crap upon crap upon crap. So here's hoping we see Crash Bandicoot reboot sometime soon. Well, we finally get to a Final Fantasy with tactics. Again, I am eluding the big one here, but you'll see what I'm doing at the end. Anyway, Final Fantasy Tactics, my brother got this for me for Christmas one year, and I remember looking at it and seeing it in ads, and I was just like, that's not Final Fantasy. They're in some weird grid-based thing. It looked kind of medieval and super violent and I just couldn't understand what this tactics was. I thought it was like some weird ripoff or something like that. Um, but I got it and I was trying to wrap my head around it. One, I didn't learn until later that the translation is like super super poor, which may be why I didn't understand what really was going on, but the tactical combat was so addicting yet so hard. That early part of the game is super super hard. but. Again, I was just starting into RPGs at this point, and I just loved it. It was my first strategy RPG, and I haven't looked back since, and it's just a fantastic game. The footage you're seeing right here is from the PSP version, and it's the best version of the game. For those with PSP or Vita, you gotta get it. You just... Oh, so good. Now, through all my videos and podcasts, you probably have heard me talk about Mega Man Legends, so I'm not gonna stress your ears too much. If you guys have watched, you know that I love it so much. It is my top games that I want to see a sequel to. When I saw Mega Man Legends 3 was in development, and it was pulled away from me, it filled me with such despair. Such Danganronpa despair. So many references in this short little clip here. But seriously, again, with Breath of Fire, this game has just an awesome visual look to it. Awesome gameplay, just a neat story for the far-flung future of Mega Man. And it's just, the first one is just my favorite. I randomly picked it up at GameStop for some fraction of a price. My dad bought it for me for my birthday. I had no idea what it was. I didn't even know it was a free action game. I thought it was just, you know, another Mega Man side-scrolling game. And uh, I was so delightfully surprised. I just love it so much. Just one of my favorite games of all time, let alone PS1. Speaking of side-scrolling Mega Man, Mega Man X4. I borrowed this from a friend or more of an acquaintance. He was kind of a scuzzy friend, but I got this from somebody at school and I had, you know, I loved Mega Man X for the Super Nintendo. I rented X2 and I never got to beat that or X3. So this was a huge step ahead. I saw that I had anime cutscenes. I was like, oh my God. And uh, the visuals aren't as cute as, you know, the 16-bit versions, but it was still an awesome game. You could play as X or Zero. They all have different moves. Um, Zero, instead of using, you know, like an ice beam from if you beat somebody with ice, he had like a sword attack and he did these kind of combo-ish 
reuse Street Fighter type moves in order to do these special attacks. And Mega Man played like Mega Man, you had some awesome armor, and again, those, those cutscenes back in the day when I was like super, super just getting into anime, and it was really hard to get anime at that time too, and which is hard to believe nowadays to you children out there. But uh, yeah, it's just a very cool game, and it kind of went downhill from there for all the rest of the X series. But I still recommend X4. I remember watching my brother play Metal Gear Solid, and just being like, oh, that game kind of looks like Siphon Filter. But I never played it, he borrowed it, and by the time I got to check it out, it was gone. So it was just kind of in the back of my head for a very long time, and then I remember going to a store to see Metal Gear Solid 2, which I rented, and I just adored that. And uh, I ran away at a friend's house one time, and uh, he had Metal Gear Solid, so I traded that for something else for him to borrow. I can't remember what it was. But I experienced 1 after 2, which is kind of weird. Um, even after the visuals of 2, I still thought they were great on the PS1. Again, some kind of low political look to it. Uh, kind of weird looking today, but the story just grasped me so much, learning about you know, Solid Snake, and I was like, oh wow, he had a whole game to him, and then you know, later on I found out that there's two other games from the MSX and, you know, the Nintendo, of course, but I just loved Metal Gear so much. It just influenced um, me being a writer and a video maker. Uh, I just loved the whole anime aesthetic and the whole spy thing. It's just super wild and crazy, and it's just so awesome. I love Revolver Ocelot. I love the boss battles in general. It was just... Ah, oh, it's just a super awesome, awesome game, and I still go back to it, and it's still awesome, and uh, yeah, that's about it. I mean, Metal Gear Solid, right? <laughs> if you haven't noticed already, this show has been a huge Squaresoft <laughs> advertising show, and of course I'm going to talk about Parasite Eve with that transition, and this was something that just blew me away as well. I can't remember how I got it, I believe my brother got this for Christmas or something, it was not mine. Either way, it was just this RPG with a female protagonist, which is something that I really hadn't experienced. Um, the RPG combat was awesome, you could run around and then you had this target practice era where everything was kind of in the dome between, uh, between healing yourself and using fire spells and other weird telekinetic powers. And it was just this weird thing that taught me about mitochondria, and it actually helped me out a lot in science class. There's a lot of things that I remember going to school and having the answer to mitochondria before anyone really knew what it was, and it really helped me out in school. It's just kind of a weird happenstance by that, but it's just kind of a weird horror um, RPG, and I still dig it. I don't think 2 holds up as well, and I don't think 3rd Birthday isn't that good either, but I appreciate them trying to bring it back. And I really would like a sequel of some sort by some happenstance, but if you experience any one of these, Parasite is the one to go. I think it still holds up. It's an awesome blend of, you know, a New York cop drama with this horror thing and awesome RPG element. Speaking of horror games, we have Resident Evil 2. Again, this was from a friend. I had experienced Resident Evil 1 first. I think my brother had gotten that from a friend. I kind of watched him play and I was kind of like, ooh, this is maybe a little bit too hard for me. But uh, again, it was a couple years later that I got to borrow this from a friend and I just loved it. Uh, everything was so much better from like the first game. And from what I experienced, again, from watching my brother, uh, just dual protagonist, the, the cityscape was awesome compared to the mansion. It, was, it felt more open. Uh, just better mechanics overall. I mean, there's a reason why Capcom decided to finally remake this one. Why people have been clamoring for it for such a long time. It's just a classic game. Uh, I'd say you gotta play 1, 2, and 4. You can probably forget about 3 and all the other random spin-offs, but 1, 2, and 4 are just awesome, awesome games. And just kind of like the peaks of some of like the best in horror games in general. And uh, you know, maybe the acting's not so great. And, you know, it's not as cute as some of the other Capcom games on the list, but it still gets me sometimes. And would you look at that, another horror game. Now, this is another game that I actually came back to after the fact. I started with Silent Hill 2, same place that I got Metal Gear Solid 2, coincidentally. Loved that game a lot, I think it's my favorite in the series still. Or 3 is very close to it though. Uh, anyway, I came back to this very, very later on, not until college when Silent Hill was on the PlayStation Network sometime post-2007, I'm not exactly sure when I got it, but I got it, 
and I was like, oh, it's still very similar to the whole vibe. There's the fog, there's the creepy monsters, you hit things with lead pipes, little random things you fall on the ground, and you just kind of walk around Silent Hill, and you know, I gotta appreciate it for the OG style of how it created this huge world that we remember Silent Hill to be. And, you know, maybe it doesn't hold up that well compared to a lot of mechanics. And maybe a lot of the games in this series don't hold up too well. But dang, I sure would love it if PT came back in some form. Here's a random RPG that I didn't find until the PSP. Now this game was touted as one of the best PlayStation 1 games I remember reading in a magazine. Never played it, it was super hard to find by the time that I saw it in a magazine. But uh, Star Ocean 2 came out for the PSP, and that's the footage that you're seeing here, just because it's easier for me to talk about it. But, you know, it's still pretty much the same exact game, so whatever, leave me alone. Anyway, Star Ocean 2 is pretty cool. It is an action RPG very similar to the Tales series. Uh, cool kind of visuals, it has random battles, the story isn't... Uh, it's you're this guy and you go back kind of in time or you're not really in time it's more like you're going to a unsophisticated planet that's kind of more medieval to his space standards he's kind of like a on a spaceship commander or king's officer whatever he goes to this un <laughs> uncivilized planet and he tries to help this girl uh, do some stuff and there's some evil and you know RPG talk you know, it's the same old, same old pretty much for a lot of these, but it's still a really cool combat and I dig it. This is getting into the era of me checking things out post PS1, which is the case for Suikoden 2, which I didn't play till very recently when it came out on the PlayStation, I believe it was this year or last year, after people have been clamoring it for so, so long, it finally came to PlayStation Network and it's just one of the best RPGs of all time and of course on the PS1. Just a very hidden treasure that, you know, I don't know what the whole deal was, why it took so long to come out, but you know, I actually got the first one in college. I remember I was like, ah, I don't need a TV, I don't need my PlayStation 3, I'm just gonna bring my PSP and my DS and that's all I'm gonna need at college. I'm gonna be so busy with stuff and then later, you know, later I found out like, yeah, oh, you're gonna have a lot of downtime, so you definitely wanna bring that stuff back. Anyway. I had bought Suikoden the first one when I got to college, and I liked it. It was kind of a cool concept for an RPG, um, but when I got Suikoden 2, whenever I played it uh, this year, last year, I know some things just clamored together in my head. It was just like, wow, everything's so much more improved. You got this gray side to each area of the battlefield. You got two friends fighting each other. You're building this huge, huge army of people and you just get all these random strangers to build your army. And it really does feel like this huge conflict that you're trying to do. Kind of like Final Fantasy Tactics where it's not so much about the hero, it's more about the whole battle in general. Just awesome, awesome game. I kind of alluded to it earlier, but yes, Siphon Filter 2 is my favorite Siphon Filter of all time. There's a lot to choose from. But it was one of the lineups that my brother had, and I remember being stuck on the first level for so, so long. I was not really used to action games in general, like a shooter, and um, I still like it. It's kind of a cool spy story. Again, the visuals aren't really great, they do not hold up, but the gameplay kind of does. The lock on feature is kind of nice for the tactical combat. But uh, I recommend you try it out just to see like one of the best games on the PlayStation and really what you know Sony was offering in this era. Toomba! Man, I don't remember how I got this demo, but I got a demo for Toomba that I played so many times. I just love this game, but I can never find it after the fact. But still, I replayed that demo so many times, it's crazy. I just loved it. You're like this weird caveman, and you're fighting pigs. Just an awesome 2D platformer that I really wasn't used to. Everything was like 3D by this point, except for, you know, a few selections that I haven't mentioned here. But it's just kind of a cool harken back to, you know, some of my favorite games on the Super Nintendo. Just a neat little weird, weird game. It had like some RPG elements too. Again, I had bought it actually very recently when it came on PSN and I found out that it's actually pretty hard and has those RPG elements that you can kind of get lost in them. You know, you get kind of stuck, but you know, thankfully there's game facts out there. But yeah, it's just an awesome, very obscure game. Square time again. This time, Vagrant Story, which is kind of set in the same world as Final Fantasy Tactics as we would later find out. But it had the same gameplay style as Parasite Eve. It's kind of like a, not really horror genre, but you know, it's kind of like Castlevania 
with some of those elements. You're walking around this castle, you're trying to figure out this huge political uproar, and you're this agent flown in to basically stop this ruckus happening. And you're fighting monsters and knights, and has that grid-based combat, and the weapon system is kind of convoluted. It's very, very hard to figure out. But once you do, it's kind of cool. Things matter with magic and the swords and everything that you use. You can upgrade stuff. It's still an awesome game that I really would like to see sequels to or an HD upgrade or something. But if you just don't have that, get the game on PSN. It's just still awesome. And, uh, you know, just the way it is. Here's another obscure thing on the list, Wild Arms 2. Now, I think I kind of mentioned Wild Arms in a couple things before, but I'm a very big fan of Wild West games, and there's really not any Wild West RPGs. So, to see Wild Arms kind of die with 5, same thing with how Squeakin' and died with 5, and Breath of Fire 5 was the last one, it's just kind of sad to see some of these kind of uh, B-tier RPGs go on the wayside. But if you check any of them out, I think 3 is my favorite, but of the PlayStation between 1 and 2, I like 2 a lot. You can start off with multiple characters and you just kind of join together. Cute um, gameplay, you know, very uh, standard turn-based RPG, but you got these cool western aesthetics to it, plus the puzzles are kind of Zelda-esque in that they're a little bit more intricate than just walking around a dungeon and fighting monsters. So it's pretty cool. And you can get it on PSN for cheap. So to those who have watched my videos, you'll probably know Shay. Now, I met Shay in Choir, and he was kind of weird, and he offered me this game called Xenogears. And it was from Square South, and I was like, oh, cool, I'll check this out. Uh, I didn't know that this was one of his favorite games, and it's a very weird... It's kind of a sad story, really. Um, Square Soft had like this vision, the, the director had this vision of this huge religious, you know, RPG with mechs. And um, basically, the budget was taken away from it to finish Final Fantasy VII. So when you're playing the game, towards the later half, you kind of see where they cut corners on a lot of stuff. And um, the same thing goes for Xeno Saga. That was supposed to be a six-episode arc. Only three were made. And then the rebirth is now Xenoblood Chronicles and Xenoblood Chronicles X on the Wii U. And everything is kind of a rebranding. And it's cool that it's kind of still going today, but not so much really. And... Um, Xenogears is just kind of a weird thing on my list. I, I feel like I should have it on there because it just influences me, again, with a lot of my writing style. But also looking back on it, it's just kind of very weird. But it has an awesome kind of anime low political look that Chrono Trigger, or Chrono, oh, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore, that Mega Man Legends has. And it's just kind of cool, weird, very, very weird. Again, poor script being translated, but it's just kind of an important game in my life, I suppose. Going alphabetically, you may have noticed that I skipped a game that I've kind of hinted at, but that would be Final Fantasy VII. Now, 20 through 2 are in no particular order besides it just being alphabetical, but I wanted to have an actual definitive number one PlayStation game, and it took me a very long time because it had a very um, close ties for a lot. I love Mega Man Legends, for example, and Castlevania Sins of the Night, but if I had to pick the one game that I've really just kind of how I became a gamer, uh, again, writing style and stuff like that. It just has to be Final Fantasy VII. Again, my brother had this game and, you know, playing Final Fantasy III it wasn't that much a difference since they're both kind of tech RPGs. And it wasn't until I saw that it used to be a medieval thing that was kind of strange. But anyway, I just seen these, like, graphics at the time and, like, the more mature story that I had experienced really a lot for my Super Nintendo games. It was just awesome. I remember playing in the basement while he was sleeping and the TV was on this huge, like, Coke shelf that you would get from a supermarket. And I believe that we got it from a friend of the family that used to work in some store. But it was super high up. I gotta say it was at least, like, oh, I don't know, like six feet off the ground. And I was sitting on the very bottom, just craning my neck up on this very tiny, tiny, like, 13-inch TV. And I had the volume low, and it was just awesome. Sitting in, like, this dark, dank basement as my brother was gone or not near or something. Just so many things. I wrote a fanfic when I was in high school. I tried to get a hold of Squaresoft and be like, I'm gonna make your sequel. Like, I have this idea. I did not know, very embarrassing, I did not know that fanfic was a thing. I thought this was the most original idea ever. I can go into 
my Final Fantasy 7 fanfic some other time. That's the only fanfic I've ever written, so I'm just gonna clear the way right there. But, uh, yeah, just... You know, a lot of people say that it's hard to go back to, but I disagree. I think it's because I hold such a special place in my part, my heart, that I can go back to it. I, I played it so many times on the PlayStation, many, many runs. I played it many runs on my PSP. I have my PS3 as well. And it just, I can go back through it and just, you know, zip through it like that. I know where everything is, kind of, sort of, as things become aware to me. And I just love it so much. The music is so awesome. And that final contact with Sephiroth, the CG cinematics. Okay, the translation was not that great. And the sequels that came after it didn't really hold up the 7. But I'm just really hoping that the remake is going to hold the same special place in my heart. And they get everything right. But, I mean, that's really my favorite PS1 game of all time. Maybe one of my favorite games of all time in any console. But... I have talked so long about PlayStation, I recommend that you really celebrate if you haven't played any PlayStation games, if you're someone that got a PS3 or, you know, a Vita or something, something that can play PS1 games and you kind of ignore them because of like, oh, the graphics. Trust me, these games are just some of the most special and um, to me at least, maybe that's not be the top 20 games of all times, but they are to me. And hey, if I want to have all the Final Fantasies on here, I could, but I kind of want to pick one game from each series. I know I didn't really do that because I had Tactics N7 on here and then I had uh, Mega Man X4 and Legends, but I feel like those four games are all very different in those same series. But either way, these are just 20 of the best for me. So buy some, get some, celebrate the 20th anniversary or something. Uh, I'm gonna get out of your hair because I'm rambling now, but yeah, happy 20th anniversary to the US PlayStation. Boom, 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 boom,